Uh, hi, Sophia and David. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, lectures from last week, which were on um, Rawls, John Rawls's theory of uh, his political theory, which like the libertarian, like Robert Nozick is also Kantian. I'll get to that. I mean, one of the big contrasts between Robert Nozick and the libertarian view that we talked about first is, um, of course, there's a very small government, which is just the police force, the military, and the courts. And taxation is seen as theft because you're taking money to go redistribute it to other people and help other people. And you don't have a right to do that because when you look at the history of how the people got their property, there's no stealing. There's no, like, as long as they got it from free trade, they went out to the land, they mixed their labor with the land, and so it became theirs, and then they sold it to someone else, and that person sold it to someone else, and that person just sold it to someone else. Uh, the government has no right to just come in and intervene and start taking things for the benefit of someone far away, right? So the idea here is that the right distribution of goods in a society is a historical matter of the chain of legitimate trades that go back to the original um, acquisition from you know, unowned nature. Somebody goes out in unowned nature, cuts down a tree, carves it into something, and then that thing gets traded and traded and traded and traded. And yeah, so some people end up rich and some people end up poor, but however the distribution is, what makes it justified doesn't matter how it's distributed, it's the history of how it got that way. And as long as there was no stealing and everything was being consensually traded, the government can't come in and readjust it because they don't like the fact that there are rich and poor people. Rawls is very different. Rawls is not looking at the history of how things got distributed. He looks at, is the system set up in a way that benefits the least well off, right? Is our taxation system, the, the, the sorts of, if we give free education to these people or free Medicare or free college or you know, how we do the voting system, all of these things need to be set up in a way that benefits the least well off. So a, a distribution system, which can have rich people and poor people is justified if and only if it benefits the least well off in society. Now, why in the world would you think the least well off in society is the basis upon deciding whether the system is justified and whether the distribution is, is good or, or bad? Well, um, he, I mean, one way to think about it is, is he's thinking about this idea of we're all just free wills. We're just these things that cho our choices matter and we're trying to interact with each other in like a fair, free way that doesn't take advantage of one another. So, you know, the fact that you're strong and the other person's weak, that doesn't matter. The fact that you're male or female, that doesn't matter. Like, what is it, what would just pure free wills, like how would they have to interact with each other? How would they choose to interact with each other? That's the sort of fair system um, that we would, that we would, that, that is appropriate for free wills this is the sort of Kantian thing appropriate for free wills to, to, to interact with each other underneath. And he gives us a way he claims of getting at what that idea, what that system would be like. He says, you imagine yourself behind the veil of ignorance. So pretend that you don't know that you're male or female. Pretend that you don't know that you're rich or poor. Pretend that you don't know that you're strong or weak or healthy or sickly or, um, you know, handicapped or not, right? You don't, you don't know anything about your personal self and you have to come to an agreement on how to arrange society with everybody else who also are behind the veil of ignorance and don't know anything about themselves. How would you choose to set up society from behind the veil of ignorance? You're trying to decide selfishly, but you don't know anything about yourself. So you can't like decide on that basis. You're just a pure free will trying to, you know, make an agreement with other free wills. Uh, he thinks you would set up a system that was the system that would benefit the least well off the most because you might be the least well off, right? You don't know your position in that society. So once you go, you leave the veil of ignorance and enter society, you might end up being the worst well off or you might end up being somebody who's very well off. But as a free will, just behind the veil of ignorance, what you're going to want to the agreement, the sort of the sort of um, agreement that you and other free wills would be able to come to, when you don't know your position in society and only know yourself as a pure free will, would be an agreement that uh, is sets society up in such a way that the least well off position is as good as possible because that might be where you end up. So um, 
it's very similar to the sort of eye cut you choose. I, I guess I didn't have this as a kid, but other people have where, you know, to cut up a, a cake fairly at a birthday party, uh, I will cut it and then everybody else picks and I get whatever slices left over. Um, and so I cut them fairly because I'm going to get the last slice. And so I need to make sure that they're all like the least, the worst slice is as good as possible because that's going to be mine. So I think essentially Rawls thinks is that you're setting up society because I don't know where I'm going to be in society. All I know I'm going to be in this society and I should set up, I should, we should all agree and everyone else would also agree to set things up. So the least well off has the best slice, the best position in society they could possibly have because that might be where you end up. And so that's different from Nozick, right? Nozick says what makes property and distributions, rich people and poor people good is that, you know, people went out and they used the land and they traded the stuff fairly and they never stole from each other and everyone consented to the trades. And so however it ends up distributed, that's perfectly legitimate, no matter how uneven it is, no matter if people are totally screwed over and completely poor and other people are super rich. Rawls is saying, no, a distribution is fair when it's set up inside, when, when, the, when the process and the system we have for distributing goods, goods like healthcare, goods like food, goods like um, safety and education are things that are distributed in such a way that benefits the least well off. And that's you, when you know you're interacting with your fellow citizens in a way that's not taking advantage of them that's fair and treats them as a fellow free will that, you know, that, that, that they could agree upon just like you could agree upon if you weren't being biased by your specific knowledge of yourself. All right. I've talked enough. Uh, I'm going to shut up and then let you guys talk. I, uh, I find Rawls idea. It's very, very tempting in my opinion, but mm -hmm. one thing that I am a little worried about is that um, he thinks that you would want to create the society that's best for the least well off. That's what you would do behind the veil of, of ignorance. I think that at least in our society, it's very clear from how people act that even if they are closer to the least well off, they still try to create a system that you know benefits people who are not the bottom because they think one day I'll be at the top or so on. So I think a lot of people more than um, he really accounts for would want to take their chances now, maybe the idea is that these people are thinking irrationally, but I certainly think that there's something to be said for the idea that people wouldn't necessarily want to benefit the least well off and instead selfishly, they would want to maximize their expected value with maybe a little bit of helping people at the bottom because maybe there's kind of this idea of diminishing returns where as you get higher up, money and so on does less for you. Wouldn't you at least agree? And so, sorry, Sophia. I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up in a second so you can respond. No, to but um, wouldn't you agree that um, at least they would want a system where the least well off could advance in the system? So if they, I mean, like, so I mean, in your system, in your idea that people will um, set up a system so there are these really well off people, and because they're hoping that they're gonna be them, I I suspect they probably wouldn't want to take the risk of having these in like complete slave class where you're there's n where there's a caste system and if you're born with a fro with curly hair you are in prison for the rest of your life and so are your children and it's like I mean I, I suspect so I think there's at least something from being behind the veil of ignorance which is going to put pressure on you to creating a certain type of societal arrangement but you're right um, people pressed Rawls on this. They're like, well, what if people are willing to take risks behind the veil of ignorance? What if they, what if they want to gamble? They're like, yeah, let, let's have a slave class so we can have them, you know, serving this elite group. Maybe I'll, you know, um, and I don't really know how Rawls's responses went to that. I know like that's, a, that's like a whole like long literature of people trying to figure out if Rawls can handle the idea of gambling from behind the veil of ignorance. But does that, is, are, are those two responses in any way helpful or no? Yeah, sort of. I mean, I think that he has something to say for that you would want to have like a base standard that's as high as possible. But I think that maybe the yeah. base standard wouldn't end up yeah. being the only thing that matters in people's decisions. They might be, they might say, as long as there's a base standards at a certain level, after that, I'm happy to have a whole bunch of like super positions just because I might get one of them. 
Uh -huh. Or like maybe you don't want to be a slave, but maybe like there's a certain point at which you're willing to like take somewhat of a risk. You're willing to, you know, maximize your expected value, right? Like, or with like the, the story of Omelas um, or like the, with the guy who's being tortured, right? To make everyone else happy. I yeah. wonder if the system Rawls proposes might just give you utilitarianism, right? That seems what would be the most logical to me, almost. Sophia. Yes. I think that's um, interesting because you do tend to see that in sort of that uh, lower working Republican kind of like middle class base in that they just, that they disagree with high taxes on the rich. And my one teacher was talking about this and he thought it was really interesting because the odds of you ever becoming a millionaire are very slim and yet people still insist on that. It's like they're hoping or that yeah, that they're just kind of like holding on to that hope that that could be them someday, but they don't see themselves as lower. So we all kind of tend to see ourselves as average and we want to go up like even behind the veil of ignorance, we never, or I think most people wouldn't ever really consider that they would be in the slave class. So that's why they're more opportune to the gambling. So I think maybe more people would gamble than we'd like to think they would because we'd like to think people are more reasonable than I think sometimes they are. I, I, so David, you mentioned this too, is like one response Rawls could have is to say, well, gambling from behind the veil of ignorance is an ir irrational thing to do. I mean, that's really hard for him to claim. Like why, why is it irrational? Like maybe that's perfect. I mean, I, 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 I wonder how he could give an, I mean, I, again, I have not put a lot of work into this and I don't know how Rawls has responded to this or how people have pushed him on this, but it, it doesn't, it does seem very difficult to me for Rawls to be able to make the move that you're just not allowed to gamble behind the veil of ignorance. Like, why not? Right. The, the idea of, of, behind, of being behind the veil of ignorance is to illustrate the idea of fairness where I'm making decisions as a pure free will without knowing any of my own personal character traits, which allows me to rig the system in my own favor. Right. I'm, I'm just carving the cake. You know, I cut, you choose. Well, I mean, what if I like cut an extra crazy slice? And I'm like, I know, I bet you I'll intimidate some people with this giant slice. And so no one will take it and it'll be the last one left. So I will, you know, like, or I'll take the risk that they won't notice that this is the best slice. And I, I, I don't know, like there's a way in which um, I don't know why risk taking is necessarily irrational from behind the veil of ignorance. And I couldn't possibly see how Rawls would make that work. Although I'm like, although this is like a big long discussion between. Rawls yeah, I mean, I think Rawls would just say that that defeats the purpose of the exercise and that they're being irresponsible and perhaps immoral in a way in that they don't really care about how their society is situated. They just think it's a joke. So one one really interesting thing about Rawls, and this is like another big piece. I don't I don't think that uh, Sandel talks about this, but Rawls is also very famous for trying to separate political philosophy from ethics. He wasn't trying to convince the ethical skeptic that Kantianism is true and then derive his system from Kantianism. Although he does like talk a lot about Kant, and he's like driving you know inspiration from Kant. He the way he sees political philosophy is. Like we're all we're already all committed that we want to be fair to each other and set up a system. Like it's like it's like your it's like you and your roommates meet on the first day of college and you're like, okay, what's a fair way for us to interact and set things like set the rules? Um, that's a hard question. Even if we already agree that we want to be fair, like what is fair? And so I think he's one of the things Rawls is trying to do here is let's just assume that we're all like people who want to engage with each other fairly and not take advantage of other free wills and interact with like what, but how do we even determine what a fair system would be? And like, this is his proposal for like imagining and thinking our way to like, would it be fair to not, you know, to make a slave class? No, because from behind the veil of ignorance, we wouldn't choose that like as a pure free will, da 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 da. So that, that's not fair. And so if we're trying to set up a fair system where we're treating each other as equals, that wouldn't be what we're doing. He doesn't really try to convince you that ethics exists, that you should be fair. I mean, he's just kind of assuming that, I mean, I mean, you, he's sort of assuming that we're, we're already at the table, we're liberal Democrats, in the sense, not, not Democrats in the political party sort of sense, but like we care about democracy and liberal value, like Western values, and we want to have equality in our society. But that 
even once we agree on all that, there's still just like this really hard question of like, what's a fair arrangement? Do we give everybody the same money? Is it communism? Do we give everybody the execs or, or are we allowed to have rich people and poor people? And he ultimately comes down to say like, okay, let me give you a theory for determining what's fair and, uh, and in, a, in alignment with these like liberal Western values. And he thinks that when you go behind the veil of ignorance, one of the interesting things he's saying is you can have super rich people. You can pay doctors a ton of money. You, you, you have to give poor people access to those doctors because it's not a system that you would be- agree upon from behind the veil of ignorance because you'd be scared that you'd be a poor person who gets less money and has no you know, access to healthcare. But if, you, but if you pay the doctors more so that you get better doctors and more doctors, which you then have a system where the poor people have access to them, you can have all sorts of inequalities where some people get yachts and some people don't. But it doesn't, and it doesn't matter because the whole thing rises up and that bottom point keeps going up too, right? Like the worst position can go up by allowing inequalities as long as we justify the inequalities by the way in which they raise the, the bottom of the boat. Yeah, that's interesting because I heard this one like politician, she was talking about socialism and saying that one of the questions was how can you justify that the wealth gap has increased? And she was saying, who cares about the size of the, like all you care about is the gap. You don't care if the gap's here or if it's here. As long as the gap is smaller, you don't care. And that was like her rebuttal against it. And that, so basically we want to raise the floor to the point where it's reasonable because we can't, I would argue you can't reasonably have a society where everyone has dead or even approximately the same amount of wealth. Like, I think that'd be very difficult to do. Well, David, actually, I'm curious about your views because first off, Sophia, I think you probably were talking about uh, AOC. So no, uh, what's no, a oh, different politician. Okay. Wait, do, no, wait, she was, a, she was a Maggie Thatcher. Ma- oh, Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so David, you're wearing you're wearing a shirt that says uh-huh. socialism on it, so I feel yeah, like it's very yeah. it's very so, appropriate for this topic. Uh, uh-huh. Thoughts? Yeah. So, um, I, my opinion here. Um, let's see. How do I want to say this? So, I I think that the really basic idea of socialism is just that like it really is kind of similar to actually the libertarian idea, which is that people should like own. The, the means of the or what they produce, right? Um, so people should own the, the product of their labor. Uh, and that's one thing that kind of turns me off about Rawls theory a little bit is I'm afraid yeah. that, I, I mean, I really kind of want to like Rawls theory, but two problems I have with it are, first of all, I almost feel like it, it says like, we shouldn't have like a slave class, for example, for the wrong reason, right? What if I empathize with the people in this class? What if, you know, I think, that it's wrong to hurt people, even if I'm not afraid of being in their position, right? Oh yeah, like um, well, we give they, slaves all these nice things, but ultimately they still have no choice and that they have to work mm-hmm. to serve the other people. But but it's not it's not my worry about being in their position because I know I'm not, right? So the whole enterprise involves me saying, well, we can't have slaves. Why? Because I can imagine what I would agree upon from behind the veil of ignorance if I didn't know, and I would be afraid of being the slave. And so I wouldn't, I mean, as a free will, me and the other free wills couldn't agree on a society that would be set up this way. It, I know who I am. I'm not actually behind the veil of ignorance. So I am being selfless when I, so, I mean, so, so there's a, I mean, it sounds selfish because you're acting selfishly from behind the veil of ignorance, but that's the only way you get like each free will standing up for itself and coming mm-hmm. to a, like an honest degree so like from behind the veil of ignorance you have to imagine the free will acting selfishly but you are not actually behind the veil of ignorance you are choosing knowing who you are freely to to restrict yourself and pass laws to things which you would agree upon from behind the veil of ignorance so like you might be in power and you might have a slave class and you say we should get rid of this why well mm-hmm. because if i was behind the veil of ignorance I wouldn't have agreed to this. Yeah, because if I was a slave, I wouldn't like it. Well, oh. if I didn't know how where my place in society was going to be, I wouldn't agree to society being set up this way. And so it's unfair for us. To, that, and that shows the unfairness of slavery. So we should get rid of it. But like you, you never not like the, in Rawls' system. He doesn't mean to like. He doesn't mean that we have to actually go blank our minds and go behind the veil. He just means it's a thought exercise. Mm-hmm. 
And when you use the thought exercise, it helps you see what's fair. And then once you see what's fair, you have to go do it. But you're right. It has this weird kind of selfish aspect to it. But I don't think the selfish aspect is really selfish because it's like acting selfishly if you didn't know your place in society. But like making that move, I mean, of course, I do know my place in society. So why should I do that unless I care to be fair and to... Mm -hmm. But yeah. I'm so I mean I, I kind of do I mean I just feel that maybe like it's a little like non but I just feel that maybe it's not the right reason um for thinking that like but I really 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 do like the idea of a hypothetical contract I mean the idea of like more or more of a real like social contract um doesn't really strike me as good the idea of a hypothetical contract that you would sign if yeah. you were logical and so on yeah, um, it does seem like a very good idea to justify um, a society. But anyway, I think that maybe it, like Rawls's conclusion does go quite a, a bit far on turning down the idea of owning fruits of your labor. Um, I think that one of the, the key ideas of socialism is that we should own the fruits of our labor, because if you work uh, at a company, um, when you're, you're putting in labor hours into the company, and eventually the company turns a profit. Um, the only way they can turn a profit and stay in business is if uh, the company got sucked some surplus out of your labor hours that wasn't that you, you, know, you put in and they paid you back less. And then that money goes back to a bunch of investors, um, investors who put money into the company, yeah. but they didn't actually do any work in order to produce the money, the capital that they got back. But I mean, I mean is they got yeah. money to create what they invested in. It's not like they, I mean, unless you're arguing that they inherited it and they inherited it unjustly, that money they put labor in to get it. So I don't think it's fair saying they did no labor to be part of this company. I think, I think both of you are looking at the wrong thing because Rawls is going to say, we don't need to we don't, we shouldn't argue about who deserves what. None of us deserve anything. We're all just the products of determinism and our, like whether our, the order of our birth determines how hardworking we are. And like, there's all like, like there's the, like, mm -hmm. even if you like work hard, like that's a product of your upbringing and your genetics. And so like, you can't even say, well, you deserve things because you're hardworking because you can't claim credit for being genetically disposed to being hardworking. And so, I mean, I think Rawls wants to say, let's just give up on this whole like deserving this talk and just say um, the reason why the system works this way, this guy gets that, this guy gets that, these investors get this, uh, even though it's like crazy is this is the system that actually benefits the least well off the most, right? Like this, like this makes sure that the worst person in society is as good off as possible, even though it involves like some asshole becoming rich on some stupid investment, but like, it turns out having the investments work this way turns out that you know it benefits society in such a way that so, like it, it has misfires, but this is the best system to benefit the least. I mean, so Rawls is going to say, I think Rawls wants to say, I, I'm just he's giving up on the idea of, I mean, so Sophia, you brought up like inheritance and deservingness. I think David, you were bringing up like investors, like who you know why do they have a right to my labor? I think Rawls wants to say in all these cases, none of these people are deserving. You're not deserving because your work is just a matter of your upbringing and hard work ethic that your parents gave you and your genetics gave you. So really we should just assume that we're all equally deserving and then just arrange things so the least well off is as good as possible and give up on the idea. So criticize this, Chris, I don't mean to, yeah. I'm just. So, I mean, I definitely agree that that's what Rawls would say, yeah. right? I mean, I definitely agree that my analysis doesn't make any sense according yeah. to Rawls, yeah. however, um, one thing I you do, think Ross is wrong. That's fine. Yeah. Well, so I mean, I, I really do kind of like I, I kind of sympathize with his view, but here's one concern, right? We want to have a society that has, you know, things that has a high GDP, right? We produce and so on. We're a, a productive society. Um, under Rawls' system, like you, you want to have some kind of society mm -hmm. that's arranged in a way such that we have things. And such that people, right, right, such that we have a high GDP, and such that people are able to like live their life to the fullest, um, right? And so there's certain values that lead to a society 
that works well, right? And under Rawls' system, right, and it just doesn't seem like, you know, right? Like, for example, even if hard work is partially dependent on, is even like very sure. much dependent yeah, yeah. on like a lot of things happening on like you being the firstborn child and so right. on. Ultimately, um, if you're, you do put in effort, then you end up helping out, you know, society, you end up helping to, you know, create the good things that we need in the world. Is, is your, is your claim here that, that, that the, a culture which disparages merit and hard work in this way as like, not like is, is just cult, that as a cultural matter, as a value matter, going to be one that just produces less and screws us over. Like the raw, the Rawlsian frame of mind is just the wrong frame of mind to have. Mm -hmm. I no. just feel like um, there's the we end up with societies that kind of in the same way that evolution works, right? We end up with societies that have certain values that lead them to be the societies that we have. Um, you can look at this in kind of a dark way too, right? Like with Rome, uh, the Roman culture was very conservative and it worked in a certain way where everybody you know, believed that you have to sacrifice everything you have for the Roman state. And it led to a state that rapidly expanded. But my point is just that maybe we can't go too far to say that, like, if you work 40 hours a week, if you work 60 hours a week, if you work 20 hours a week, maybe the person who works more should end up getting more money because we want to incentivize working more because we'll lead to a better society for everyone. I don't think Rawls ever argues against incentivizing certain things. I do think he just argues for how we should benefit the least well off in any way we can because we could potentially be them, which is why I think it's necessary to have a large disparity because like you said, I don't think we have enough motivation for people to work hard if everyone, if no matter what you do, you all end up the same. Then I do not, I don't really think people would work hard. I mean, you don't even have to be elitist about it, right? So you generally think that, like you're saying, Sophia, that you would pay like doctors more because we need people to be doctors, but you could pay some sh like job that sucks. That's pretty simplistic. There's just no, no one yeah, wants that to, too. that no, I mean, we could, we, it, it could turn like out that sewer like, workers. or like it, it could turn out that a McDonald's retail worker in 2050 when everything, it, you know, basically all retail work has been eliminated. No one wants to do that last retail job and we have to pay them an enormous amount of money to convince them to do it. Uh, I, I, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't mean to like attach value judgments to people who get paid more. Um, but you can have a system which has these vast inequalities for any number of reasons, which just make things work. But D David, are you, I, I'm just curious, are you okay with these vast inequalities or no? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. All right. I, so I just, how I do you think a society can function it. without inequalities, at well, least on some level? Have some inequalities on some level, right? Right now, the inequality in America is greater than it was in French revolutionary France, right? Right before the revolution, we now have a worse wealth uh, inequality gap, right? Um, so, I mean, we can certainly have a society with some inequality, but the level of inequality we have right now, right? I mean, I'm really going to justify it on utilitarian grounds, ultimately, which is I'm going to say that we have like so much wealth in society everybody collectively worked to produce this well. Jeff Bezos doesn't work a thousand times harder than his employees. Um, and so we, we've all worked to create this wealth, but we have right, thousands and thousands of people dying every year because we have not a problem of scarcity. We do, scarcity does definitely exist. Right, but like if you look at the amount of houses that are out there, I think there's like seven houses unoccupied for every homeless person. Right, no one has to be homeless in this country. People have to be homeless because uh, of certain, you know, it, it benefits certain people at the top for the system to work in the way it currently does. I and mean, I don't think Bezos that, like, wants homeless people in his city. If anything, he doesn't want homeless people because that devalues the property of certain neighborhoods and then people don't want to live there. Like, I don't want to really use this term, but the hood or like ghettos, like no one wants those to exist. Like people specifically go in and they raise the housing prices and they get the homeless people out of there 
because they want to raise the housing prices and increase value. And also like all those houses that are unoccupied, let's be honest, they're in the middle of nowhere. They're like in the countryside. Like if you drive into counties where there are less people, that's where the unoccupied houses are. Yeah, and it's because I mean, so, no yeah. one can find work there or they're like I mean, burned down. I mean, Sophia, you're pointing out like sometimes the houses are located in the wrong locations. Yeah, like they're in the, the middle are the job of nowhere. Is. And there's also, I mean, this is actually not all of it, but some of it is, I mean, at least for veterans, a lot of the remaining homeless veterans are people with severe mental problems that like they just burn down the house that but I mean, there, I think, I think David, I, think, I don't mean to like disagree with you, David, that there are way more homeless than there need to be. I'm just saying that I don't think, I do think that there's never going to be zero because there's like a little bit of, at least with veterans, I think we've gotten probably as low as we can go. Um, and and this, like this shows like the bottom limit of where you're just dealing with mental illness and stuff where you can't mm -hmm. go. To, but, but Sophia, you were raising, so I, I'm remembering the, the, the Margaret Thatcher quote you were saying earlier. Sorry, I didn't like, it didn't click until, until now, but yeah. you, you were pointing out who cares about how big of a, like that Jeff Bezos makes a million whatever dollars. If that actually raises, like if this system that happens to like, instead, like happens to get, make him rich, is one that benefits the least well off, right? What we care about is a system, like if, if it turns out that the system, like the system- Yeah, like which supposedly out, we yeah. care about the least well off. Yeah. Yet, if, for example, in the US society, I would argue we're one of the richest nations that's ever existed. Like our homeless people have cell phones and yet David is here arguing about how, <laughs> you know, how it's so much worse that the wealth disparity is so much larger. I mean, obviously we have issues, but they're nothing com historically. Mm -hmm. And like uh, your point about like homeless veterans, like there was this one guy kind of near the area where I live and you could just tell, like he would just wander up and down this, and you could just tell he was crazy. Like he was yeah. very mentally ill. And my dad was saying like, even if, the you know government or someone literally gave him a house would he be happy or competent to live in it like i, I don't I, think I, so i i mean i so i do want to agree with you sophia that like and like i was saying about there's just like a lot of people who are homeless and like you can't limit but i think david is right that there is a lot of ho more homeless people than there needs to be yeah i, I think more can I think, be done i'm not i think, sure. the, I think the, 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 the zero right the, the, i think the veteran population is the rare case where the u.s has actually tried to take it to zero and we we're kind of hitting the lower like we actually can't get any lower like this turns out to be this for like various mental health reasons and all sorts of drug addiction reasons that you can't go any lower but like, we're not even trying that with the rest of the homeless population. So like, yeah. I, I, I wish we treated all Americans like we treat veterans. Like we gave all Americans the healthcare I get. We tried to eliminate American poverty in the way that we tried to eliminate veteran poverty. Um, yeah, if we behind could the veil of ignorance, we should treat everyone like the veteran community. We should treat, we should treat everybody like veterans. I, it's weird to be a veteran because you get this sort of honorific praise, like, oh my God, you get free healthcare and, we can't let you be homeless. You can't be home. Those people can yeah, be homeless, yeah, yeah. but not you. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't, I mean, like, I don't, okay. I mean, I got shot at a couple times, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you're like, um, so did some of the kids in West Baltimore, you know? Yeah, right. Can I, can I respond to what uh, Sophia yes. said about yes, the, uh, yes, 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 okay. So if you go back, if you wind back to like right before Ronald Reagan, and Trey, right, the sixties or so, um, yeah. back when we had like, I think a 90% tax on like the highest income bracket. Right, right, right. And if you look back then, uh, productivity was rising and wages were rising. And in this time, we had like lots and lots of union participation. Um, we had, you know, lots of programs that people would call kind of very progressive and yes. so on. And, and we ended up having was we had productivity rising and we had wages rising along with productivity. So uh, that's you know, kind of the system that you want, because what it means is, you know, we are producing more wealth. And um, even if a lot of the wealth is going to wealthy, a lot of it is also going to people who are actually creating the wealth. However, yeah. if you look at like the wage graph, right? You look at like 70s or so. Oh, yeah, yeah. Reagan. All of a sudden, yeah, like the, the productivity is still going up like this, right? Yeah. Wages are basically flat, right? So 
we say that like, well, it's justified to, you know, keep having like all these vast sums of money go to Jeff Bezos because it's making the world a better place. But like, also, first of all, we have to subsidize like workers who work for Bezos, workers who work at Walmart, everyone, all of us, we have to subsidize their health care because their employers don't pay them enough money. So not only are we paying directly our cash out of our own pockets in order to subsidize people getting wealthier and wealthier, but also we're getting less and less of the benefit. People today are being born into a world where they have less opportunity than there was, than our parents had, right? We legitimately, like the, the quality of life for our generation- We, we, we can I, all, we can all agree, fuck baby boomers, right? We're all on board with- Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but- I mean, uh, I just don't see how in yeah. a fair society you can force Jeff Bezos to pay his employees yeah. fairly. Obviously we would love to live in a society where that happened, but yeah, that's a great point. Like for example, I paid more in taxes last year than the entire company of Amazon. And I, this was and, and when Donald I was, Trump. When I was a minor. Donald Trump, I'm sure. Maybe not paid, that much, he paid, but. He paid, he, he paid 700 bucks. But yeah, definitely close to like, in terms of like Medicare and the other thing minors have to pay. Like I paid more taxes for that than entire yeah. companies. Well, I, so, I mean, just to get back to, to Rawls and Nozick, right? So I think we've kind of got, uh, I mean, Rawls actually is very liberal. He loves, I mean, he's not going to defend Jeff Bezos. He actually does. I think he does support a wealth tax. He thinks, I mean, the, the, for various reasons, I, I think he's much, I think he thinks that things are way out of whack in the capitalist direction. I mean, he's defending a certain level of markets and stuff, but it's far more liberal than we currently are um, in a way that I think David might be, I don't know if we should go further, but it's at least like much further in, in yeah, David's on the right track. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but the, the the opposing view is Nozick, and Nozick says Jeff Bezos made his money. Fit. Is, did Jeff Bezos steal it? No, he like offered a service. People paid for it. There was an exchange. Why do you get to take his money? Because I mean, like, do, because there's other people somewhere distantly that are sick. I mean, it'd be nice of him to to donate it. Like maybe he's morally obligated to. Maybe it's only supererogatory. We've talked about charity, I know. But like the idea that you can come with guns and, and use force to steal it from him to go help these people um, when when he has done nothing. I mean, he when the way that the distribution has occurred where he's ended up with all this money was just through free exchange. What is the grounds that Rawls gets to cut? I mean, Rawls, one, one of the complaints Nozick makes is no, Rawls pretends as if there's just all this money in the like up in heaven and he's deciding how to distribute it when there is actually, it's already distributed. And there's a whole history of how it got that way of free trade, you know, of like free of people making choices with one another. He's got to steal it all up and then redistribute it according to his plan. And, and, and Nozick wants this. I mean, Sophia, does this seem like the, the defense of Jeff Bezos that you want to make? I think. Um, yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, personally, like nothing's ever really completely fair in terms of these trades like you know there's always someone potentially getting gypped so I don't think it's like entirely like like you know to a certain extent like there's fraud and scams and there should be systems to mitigate that but yeah for the most part like it would well, be nice of him but I don't yeah. think he has he's obligated to. No, Nozick doesn't usually talk about Jeff Bezos, but he, he talks about uh, Wilt Chamberlain, who is, I guess, a, a famous basketball player who, who, and anyway, his example is Chamberlain puts in his contract that he gets to put, that everybody who comes to the games has to put a dollar, extra dollar in a bucket, which goes directly to him or he's not going to play. So every fan who buys a ticket, they put in it. And so anyway, long story short, through like people want to see Wilt Chamberlain play, he puts a stipulation on under what conditions he's willing to play for them. They give him a dollar, like everybody gives him a dollar to watch him play. He plays, he collects the money. Now he's super rich. His fellow players are not anywhere near as rich. And there's poor people like where, but why did, why do we get to take his money? Like it was just, I mean, again, Jeff Bezos is a little weird because you could probably tell some sort of story about, I mean, Amazon is not necessarily always doing the best business practices. And, but I think the Will Chamberman example is nice, right? You end up with someone who's rich and it doesn't seem like there's any, coercion or weirdness going on so why do i get like he he made a deal with all of these fans and the team 
and his teammates, like I get an extra dollar from all the fans who show up fans. You have to pay an extra dollar. Everybody agreed. He played. Why do we get to like show up and say, well, we got to take some of that money to go redistribute it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I definitely think for the, the Amazon one, I think that's much more, there's a much stronger argument there. Right. Um, because with um, Jeff Bezos, right, and with Amazon, um, we say, you know, libertarians will say the contract was voluntary, both sides agreed to it and so on. Um, but however, when it actually comes down to it, um, you have to agree to do some job. Um, you know, there's an Amazon warehouse in your area um, and you sign up for it. Uh, you have to, if every job is going to steal your surplus value as every single job in the whole country does inherently because that's how jobs work. Yeah. Then no matter what job you choose under capitalism, you're still being exploited. There's no agreement you can make that's not going to steal your money. Sophia? I mean, in what system does that not happen? Like, for example, communist countries. In what communist country is your are you given more for your labor than what you deserved? A society literally cannot function that way. It will be inherently in debt if you give, like, for example, you give the example of we want to have a high GDP so we can help people. We can't have a high GDP if we're paying people more than they're worth, then the work they're generating is worth. A company literally cannot function that way. Even if you're giving them a reasonable or a fair, I would say as much as possible deduction on the equal amount of labor, I think that would be better than trying to give them exactly or more because there wouldn't be a job for them if you did that. Mm -hmm. Well, here's an idea. Um, so the problem is, right, you work for a company, people own shares in the company, uh, and the people who invest in the company didn't make any, didn't actually earn any of the money. They're stealing the money, essentially. They're doing no labor in order well, to get hold, the money. Hold, no, hold, hold, hold on. Stealing. Hold. I mean, Nozick is going to say, like, they got that money through, I mean, either someone handed it to them because their parents, like, like, their parents freely gave it to them or they got it through trades. And then they, I mean, like, like, where is the stealing? There, there doesn't seem to be any stealing going on, right? They got that money and they're offering to hand you the money to, like, do a yeah. job. To, Investing you know. is just a good management of personal finances. Like, for example, I've worked since I was 14. And should I let my money rot in the bank where it's losing money on the dollar because of the interest rate, sorry, of inflation? Or should I invest it wisely and try to earn some gain on that? I don't see how that's stealing. Because the investor makes money. So uh, that they put is no, making money they stealing? Put, they put no labor into making the money, right? Didn't I put the labor value, into creating the money I'm investing? The value comes from labor, um, right? That's where money derives its value. Um, everything you have, every object, has a certain amount of labor hours put into it that gives it value. But when you invest money into a company, um, you get money for free. Um, so, I mean, it's very, it's a very good deal if you're saying, well, should I invest myself? I mean, the answer is probably yes, but that doesn't mean that it's just for you to make money for doing nothing. So now you asked me um, to give a better system. Uh, here's a controversial take. Um, one economist, computer scientist wrote uh, a series David well, can I can I just add I'm something in, yeah. in in support of your position? Is something I thought you were also going to say because you were saying this earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Another argument you could be giving is um, the reason why they're stealing your I mean, because you're you're coerced into having to work, right? Like I think that's part of your your claim is that yeah. So I think I think the claim is this isn't a fair transaction. Um, yeah. But okay, okay. Now continue your, your yeah. thing. I just, yeah, I just no, felt no. like I wanted you to make, yeah, I wanted no. to repeat that claim you were making earlier. Yeah, yeah, too. no, that, absolutely, right. Part of the the whole thing is you're forced to work, right? You have to eat, you have to eat, right? Yeah. Um, yep. You, so you you have to get money, you have to work. Um, okay, computer scientist. What do we got? Some computer scientist. Unfortunately, it would be a lot better if I could remember his name. I don't remember it. Some okay. guy, some economist, wrote a paper where he gave an algorithm for um, how we could take money, right? And we could figure out where to invest it. And he claims that his algorithm gives better results um, than the current system does, right? We kind of have this current system, which is like a lot of people, like 50 or so people kind of decide 
where to put all the money and so on. It really is a centrally planned economy, right? I, no, I'm going to, I'm going to strong, um, well, I'll, I'll let you finish. I'm sorry, okay. but strong, strong disagree with what, where uh, the direction you're going, but go yeah. ahead. Is that we, we have all these like hedge funds and so on. We have all of these, um, you know, 401ks and so on. We have all these banks. Um, maybe now it's not really 50 people, right? So it's a lot more than that. Well, but, I mean, the, the idea here is is that they, it's it's thousands of people all in competition with each other and yeah, trying everyone's to out trying to and, get the highest dividend over the other. No one's so yeah, centralized. No, centralized planning would be like there is one organization. We show up, we take a vote. These guys are in charge. You know, like and and the idea here is you have a like a bunch of people in competition with each other. Lots of small money managers, large big money. I mean, you're right in some sense that there are these big banks, right? I think that's your point is that you end up with these arrangements by the Fed and Chase Manhattan, you know, Chase Bank and like these big, and, and then so it, it feels like, I mean, you might be right. I mean, there, there probably is some point to be said here that we're like drifting towards the centralized economy in this, in the way in which you end up with mm -hmm. these massive banks, which all end up in the same room with the treasury department. And they all have a big meeting on to that, you know, after the financial crisis and agree who has to buy Bear Stearns. Like that's all seems pretty, pretty centralized planning ish. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't, I, okay. But yeah. All right. And I, I, maybe, maybe strong. I, I, well, pretty strong disagree, but uh -huh. I think I, I do, I do see your point. Okay. Well, yeah. maybe the, the problem here is in the word of exactly centralized planning. Because maybe. My thing is more of like a couple thousand, it's still like 0.001%. Like, let's of the say public. the top 1% of richest people in the country agree how to divide their wealth to increase certain things. Mm -hmm. But, the, but the, I mean, the basic, the, the basic idea is that you can't set the value of something except for its mark. I mean, the value of something is its market. I mean, you're, you're saying the value of something is its labor hours that have been put into it, right? Yeah, the yeah. alternative view I, is uh, the, uh, uh, an object's value is the market value, whatever it is. And you need a market of a whole bunch of people competing to buy it if they want, like you need eBay. And then you can, so if I wanna know how much a rare, to, a rare toy I found from when I was a kid is worth, I mean, there's no, like I can't find the, like the, it's not how much I labor I put into preserving it or how much labor went into making it, it is, I put it on eBay. A whole bunch of people have an option to spend money on it. They 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 do work to get money, and they're like willing. And then and like whatever that market assigns it, that's its worth. Versus, I think the sort of Marxist. I, I think Marxist. Although, I, to be fair, I do not know my Marx. But the Marxist theory, where where value is assigned to things by like labor input. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's definitely that, like the big debate, you know, is labor value actually the correct way of looking at value, right? Is it market value? Um, I think that the market value is subject to, both views have some problems. I think that the market value view is subject to a lot of like wacky influences, right? Uh, I mean, there's stuff like, I think the viewers, Diamond Corporation, like, he's sure. kind of jacked sure. up the price of diamonds yeah. and so on, yeah. uh, right? Do you can you can like toy with things in a way yeah. that like makes the actual like because there'd be huge disparities between labor value and market value. Yeah, I, it's so, like stocks I, and plane yeah. tickets are what wait, I wait, like what's, to say this. What's the what what is the stocks and plane tickets? Plane ticket. I have this one friend who she always she follows plane ticket prices like you would stocks. And if you do it for a couple of months, there are huge like Spikes, valleys yeah. and crests. Right. Like it's a, a much bigger disparity than than you would ever imagine. But I'd like to uh, offer a different view. Like for example, yes. say you have a toy or some fairly heir, family heirloom that to you is priceless and the labor value and the market value are completely different to what you would hold it to be. Like how would that system fit in? Like for example, say I have a family heirloom and I would never consider selling it. Uh -huh. There was there was a there was a water gun that I really so I really loved this show called Captain Power and the uh, Soldiers of the Future when I was a kid. It lasted one season. It was these like Power Ranger type guys who were fighting the whatever, right? Anyway, uh, the toys were really hard to come by because the show got canceled and they all disappeared. And I had this one friend who had this junky water gun that was from the show, and I. I was, I was, I, I desperately, I mean, he didn't care about it. It was just like one of the water guns in the big bin. 
to him and I was like, how can I buy this for you? Can I get it? For but I mean, we're all, I mean, particularly when you're kids, you're loss averse. You don't want to lose something you own. So he was, it was a strong no from him. In retrospect, I could make some sort of utilitarian argument for stealing it. And, and sometimes <laughs> it, in classes, I tell this story and then I pull the gun out <laughs> and, and imply that I stole it. But really what happened was I became an adult and I remember this story and I have this like, like deep hole in my heart of wanting this water gun. So I like watched eBay for years and years and years until it finally popped up. Some asshole like was selling a broken one for 50 bucks. I bought that thing in a second, just to give you an example, right? I mean, the market value is what people are willing to pay for it. And somebody was willing to pay $50 for like a broken chinksy water gun. See, I mean, but but that's the that's the that's the way in which market value is arbitrary. I mean, it just it depends on needs. It depends on what people value. It depends on who's out there. It depends on if the market's accessible to everybody. If you know, if I if I didn't have access to eBay, uh, I wouldn't know about that water gun. Water gun. So, but I mean, the the idea there would be that you can't assign something value. You just have to like there's a there's 350. Um, million Americans, there's 7 billion people in the world. The bigger you make the market, like you can let the market, you know, the more people have access, you can have the value set by that. And presumably things work better because you're able to, any, anyway, long story short, I'm just, I, I, Sophia, your point is like, well, how do you set the, the, the price of a, like a, a, a priceless heirloom? It's like, well, at some point you have a certain amount of money. You just, you, you, like at you some point bid, everyone has you, a price. You bid, you bid as much as you can or until it starts like eating into your food supply and then you're like, all right, I'm out. Um, yeah. But I mean, this is, this might be where David complains. <laughs> yeah, the rich, well, the rich person can come in and I could never buy anything if Jeff Bezos wanted everything I wanted, right? Uh -huh. He would always outbid me. He would always. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, Wait. and about the investing thing, because David, you have to let me respond to that. But okay, okay. investing does take work, I would argue. Making wise investments, you really do have to look into the company, to their history, what they're doing, or if you don't, you pay someone else to do it for you. And while you can also make money for doing nothing, which I would argue you're not doing nothing, you can also lose a lot of money for doing quote unquote nothing. Mm -hmm. So I, is it right to lose money for doing nothing as well? Uh-huh. Oh, can I, uh, can I, so like, uh, actually, it turns out that I think like most people's like personal portfolios are like not quite as good as hedge funds. Um, and so, I mean, you can do like lots of work. You can be day trader. You can spend like all day trying to like trade and, and so on. Wait, just because um, someone does a bad job doesn't mean they didn't put a lot of effort into it. And you claim yeah, I mean, that put, the labor is what into, makes it valuable. They put effort into figuring out what they wanted to invest in, but they didn't actually create any value in the world. They They kind of did like, um, this kind of managing where they tried to figure, they essentially tried to play a very small role in figuring out where society should allocate its resources, right? No, no, I think that's exactly, I mean, that's, that's the reason that they're there to figure out how society, I mean, they're, they're like them playing this stupid game with the money is, the, is the way we determine what companies uh -huh. should have. I mean, them, them competing against each other to invest in the right companies. Mm -hmm. So they get a payout is the way we figure out which companies deserve to have more money. So, I mean, you're right, David, that's exactly what their, like, yeah. their value is supposed to be. But like, it, it seems as if though, like, giving like random people uh, the ability to decide, right? This doesn't always end up with the best results. Like I said, um, you know, like if you look at, you know, skilled investors versus bad investors, skilled investors make a lot more money. Um, and so you can say, well, they rewarded the back, they can invest more and so on. Um, but just overall, our system of government, or sorry, of the economy would be a lot more, would be much, we would get much more money out of it, right? Like for essentially for free, if we had better ways of allocating where the money went. Um, and so that means, you know, having people whose job it is, you know, hedge fund managers and so on. Uh, it also means having uh, potentially, you know, like giant computers with like algorithms trying to figure out where society should allocate its resources to. But I mean, the way, the idea is that you, the system works best when you have a whole bunch of people competing against each other to like mm -hmm. invent, like you, like, and they get, they, and they get a huge payout, which means they can, like, they, they can, they can get people to give them a bunch of money to like, be like, I've got a harebrained idea how to make AI make trades better. And then they like can get a millions and millions of dollars to spend like going down this total dead end. But like, 
what you need is a whole bunch of people throwing money at crazy people trying to do a better job at this. And the idea is the, the combined effect of all of that is supposed to be good and, and, and much better than if you just said, well, the way we're going to distribute it is the government just decides which companies get the money, what things get produced. But that's the centralized system, mm -hmm. right? Where uh -huh. you just yeah, you vote like or not somebody, some, you know, government power just, and that's, and I mean, the idea here is that mm -hmm. they just do a shitty job and it's much better. I mean, that's the, that's the claim. Sophia, you were going to say something. I mean, while individuals may not, and a lot of them do it poorly and some do it very well, I think it'd be a lot better. Like, for example, the concept of angel investors who, like I've said, take crazy ideas and make them really profitable, amazing things. If we had such a centralized system, I don't believe that would happen as much. So instead of taking a chance that the one system would be perfect, wouldn't it be better to divide up the chances between all the people who do choose to invest? Wouldn't that make it more fair? Because if we do have just the one system and it you know, just decides, hey, I want my buddy's company to be the best, what stops that? Like, I don't see how there's a regulatory body and that's what the free market's there to do. I, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let David have the final word because I feel like we we're getting away from Rawls yeah. versus Nozick and the philosophy and just arguing about uh, politics and economics in general, which I love. I, yeah. I'm loving this conversation, but these poor students that are uh, that are watching us yell at each other are like, wait, where's the Rawls and Nozick? I, yeah. I, I need like, where's my what do I need to know yeah, for the test? Yeah, I'm but very, um, so really stop watching. Probably. So da yeah, yeah. This, this, that, if you have stuck around to this to this point in the lecture, hold on, I need to do something so I can ask a quiz question, like an extra credit. What is, what is the shape? What is it that I've just drawn? Hold on. Uh -huh. And then I can ask this as like an extra credit question on the final. Don't tell, don't tell your fellow students. Wait, I gotta write this down it, before it, I forget. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm doing, I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing Humpty Dumpty on the wall. Right, okay. like the Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Humpty Dumpty, you know, and all the king's men and all the king's horses couldn't put him back together again. So this is my, this is my. I think Humpty Dumpty was an egg, and he was sitting on a wall, right? And he got knocked over. Yeah, 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 that's not yeah wasn't he? I don't know. I actually don't know the story. Yeah, 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 so was, if you know. stuck around to this point, I'm going to ask an extra credit question on the final exam, asking you what what I drew, and you can yeah. say Humpty Dumpty. I'm not even making it multiple choice. You got to type in Humpty. I mean, I don't know how to spell that. All right, maybe I'll make it multiple choice because I'm not going to say make the they would really deserve that extra point if they stuck around. If, yeah. yeah. Also, like, if they could spell Humpty Dumpty, I don't even know. Yeah, if yeah, I yeah that's that. true. I might, I might get a, I yeah, might get, might get that for that one. Uh -huh. But, um, but yeah. So thank you, uh, David. You're going to take us out with some final. All right. Um, pitch for your Marxist ideals. All right. All right. So. Uh, I'm just trying to say is it's sort of centralized already because uh, ultimately the people who do the best job who make the most money off of it are for a large part people who well sometimes people get lucky like angel investors and so on but one of the most the, really the most consistent way to make money right if you're trying to optimize your value um, you know get into like a hedge fund uh, and essentially you're getting the money from it right but you don't even get like investors get to vote in company matters. Um, and so ultimately, I think employee, you should be able to have a large say in how a company is run. Um, but a small number of people, maybe a couple thousand, uh, have an extremely massive, I don't know there's what the number is, but there's a specific number for it. A very small number of people control like the voting in almost like in such a large number of companies because of how hedge fund works and so on. Um, so my point is ultimately just that I think that we should have people, um, we should have this ability of like managing the market. Um, it shouldn't be something that people get a massive amount of money for. I think that's exploitative. I think that the money that workers earn should go to the workers. Um, and I think that there's a better system out there. My biggest problem is just figuring out how we get past the current neoliberal like capitalist system we're in because any attempt to like really attack the heart of the issue just like com just completely destroyed by like the capitalist giant like smackdown all this money well, 
there's always the the what is it the accelerantist position where like let's just yeah really, accelerationist let's, let's, position let's push let's push the capitalism to the limit until everything collapses and then we'll finally have the chance to institute the but yeah uh, so David give, you should just become a huge capitalist and then uh -huh. we yeah. can get your yeah, yeah, plan yeah, yeah, going yeah. sooner but um can can you tell me what Rawls's response would be to you and then what no, you think Nose's response okay would be? all right um Rawls's position would be um he would just say that like I have it all wrong by like saying that people that the workers actually deserve their labor I think that's right. um, at all. I think they, I think you would say that they're entitled. So like he talks the difference between entitlement and deserving. If you win the if you buy a lottery ticket and you win, you're entitled to the winnings. You don't deserve it. You didn't do any work. You just blind luck that you won. I still have to give you that money. You still I you're still entitled to yeah. it. And I think the claim is. He's like, let's just drop talk of undeserving this entirely. This is a system which benefits the least well off. We distribute riches and goods based on this, what you're entitled to according to the fairest system. Like, so workers get this because they're entitled to it. Why are they entitled to it? Because this is the right system to use because it benefits the least well off. I think that's what Rawls would say. Uh -huh, yeah. What about Nozick? Uh, and I think what Nozick would say is that I dramatically <laughs> underestimate like how bad it is that the government does taxes. Yeah. Um, because he said he would say the difference is when you make an agreement with your employer, right? You've both agreed to it. It's consensual, and so it can't possibly be wrong. Um, whereas the government inserts itself into your contract, you don't have a choice in that. But he would say. At gunpoint, by the way, you choose one contract, right? You ultimately, the you know, the Amazon worker decides to work at Amazon. Uh, they can quit if they want. All right, that's what he would say. Sure. Sophia, I am so sorry. I feel like, I mean, I think me and you were on the same side defending capitalism against David this time, but I think that I like I got pretty fiery and might be like was yelling. No, at, like, you're fine. Okay, but <laughs> I think we're nice on the same side for. <laughs> yeah, I don't know go. if that happens all the time, but. Um, yeah, I actually really do like Rawls' argument that we don't, if we really, really think about it, we don't really deserve what we have in the extent of like our backgrounds and, you know, where we come from and all of it really does play into where we ended up more than we like to think it did. You saw the point where he asked um, the audience in that Harvard class how many of them are first born, and it was just like because because psychology yeah, that shows, was crazy, and like yeah. ninety percent of the people's hands went up, and because uh, because psychology seems to indicate that he first didn't borns expect that. tend to be, I mean, not again, it's just an average, but like have a strong tendency to being the most go getters, mm -hmm. highest achieving. Yeah, no, I mean, because I'm the. I'm the oldest in my, I mean, I only have one other brother. I mean, partially I would say like people do have smaller families, especially more well-off professional people. So maybe that would contribute to it more. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder about like how many, does he count single oh, yeah, children, children and, and, and how big, but, but, I, but I do think that there is, there is some cycle. I mean, like he, he is referring to something like a well-known psychological fact. I, I, it is just dramatic to see that uh, in that Harvard classroom that, that many people would be firstborns. But, uh, but I do believe it's true that, again, you can be a second or third or fourth born and still be a total bad, like the more successful one and your firstborn can be a heroin addict. Um, it's just averages, but like something seems to, something seems to be tends to push firstborns to be more successful and work harder and achieve more and of course you can't claim you can't claim that you being firstborn is something you did uh like that you that you deserve credit for what comes from that so um and so raw i mean that's right that's part of Rawls's claim that you really don't even you don't deserve how hard you work, how hard you strive. I mean, some of that's genetics, some of that is your uprising, and some of it is just being firstborn. And like, of course, that's not something that you can claim. I mean, so when David talks about like labor, you you deserve the fruits of your labor. And 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 I think Rawls is going to say, yeah, you know, I mean, like, yeah, you work hard, but you, you working hard is just because you're privileged and you had parents who like taught you to work, you know, like whatever, right? And mm -hmm. so you can't claim to that you can't make a claim of deservingness to, to the products of that part. I find that both very attractive and also extremely adversive. Like I, I, I am hor I'm both horrified by that view of like complete, I mean, for a Kantian view that just makes, oh yeah, everything's determined 
nothing you do is your your fault everything is just your there's i'm like this sounds not very kantian at all like this sounds like really dehumanizing um (laughs) so i worry i worry i I mean i I see his point but i'm also like pretty horrified by that Uh i don't know i don't know i I, this political philosophy is weird for me i ping pong between like a but i mean a bunch of different positions and I, I never find a stable resting ground. I read, you know, I read Rawls. Mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh yeah, that sounds all great. And then I read Nozick. And I'm like, Nope, that seems all great too. You know, I just can't, <laughs> I feel like you guys, I assume what this no, is what I undergrads actually... are like taking this class. Like you guys, like I give you one position, you guys are like, that sounds right. And then I give you a different position the next week and you're like, that one now sounds right. And you're like, Oh shit. Yeah. Like even now during got... this talk, like I'm sure I've totally ping pong, you know, yeah. like it's just. <laughs> yeah. So this is one of those areas in philosophy that I, I can't find a stable resting point. Um, but maybe if I learned more about Marxism, I, uh, I would be able to find that final right answer. The final, the, the, I won't call it the final solution. The final right answer <laughs> uh, the, to, to, to uh, political philosophy. Um, good, thank you. I'm gonna end the recording now, but stick around. Let's talk and chat a little bit after this. Hopefully I, I need to stop this here.